podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Mmm, grits and gravy. What could be better? I'll tell you what. Grits, ground the old-fashioned way at an honest-to-goodness, old-fashioned grist mill. Power up the water wheel and get your taste buds set for stone ground goodness. It's what's cooking next in Flavor NC. Flavor NC was made possible by Got to be NC Agriculture, the official state identity program for products grown and processed by farmers and value-added food companies in North Carolina. When you want the best, it's got to be NC. The Currituck County Department of Travel and Tourism. The Currituck County Outer Banks. More value, more excitement, more than you imagined. Additional support was provided by the following. There's no Main Street, no zip code, and you won't find it on a map. But our place is just as real as every mouth-watering morsel grown, raised, or harvested in North Carolina. Welcome to Flavor and Sea, the heart and soul of local food. There are few things more picturesque than an old grist mill resting on the banks of a lovely stream. It was the ancient Greeks who first figured out how to harness the power of water to grind corn and wheat into flour and meal. They did it by inventing gears with interlocking teeth and then the water wheel to turn them. For centuries, the grist mill was an integral part of community life around the world. Farmers grew corn and wheat, then brought it to be ground. The miller kept a portion in exchange for his services. Fact is, if you had been around in colonial days, you would have been hard pressed to find a community anywhere in the colonies that didn't have at least one grist mill. Water powered grist mills are few and far between these days, but they're still out there if you know where to look, and it just so happens that Otis and I do. That place would be the town of Oak Ridge in Guilford County. Settled by Quakers in the years before the American Revolution, this part of Guilford County was long known as a quiet farming community. There are still a lot of farm fields in Oak Ridge, but a lot more residents too. Somehow, it's a combination that seems to work. After all, it's not often that you pass by pastures where miniature horses graze on your daily commute. But you can if you live in Oak Ridge near Ravenwood Farm. Old and new just seem to coexist peacefully in Oak Ridge. The second oldest military school in the country is still going strong here after 150 years. In fact, the town of Oak Ridge takes its name from the Oak Ridge Military Academy founded in 1852. Something else that's still going strong in Oak Ridge? The grist mill that sits on the banks of Beaver Creek. At one point, there were more than 40 grist mills in Guilford County, but today, the old mill of Guilford is the only one left. The mill first opened for business in 1767. Yep, you heard correctly, 1767. And it's been turning out stone ground corn, wheat, and other whole grain products ever since. Pretty amazing when you stop and realize the mill has quietly gone about its business through the American Revolution, two world wars, and countless economic recessions and even depressions. There's a lot of history tied up in this one little building. It's even on the register of National Historic Places. Legend has it that General Cornwallis marched his troops right by here on his way to the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Not wanting to pass up this golden opportunity, they took over the mill to grind grain for their soldiers prior to battle. That long history is one of the things that prompted Amy Klug and her husband Darrell to buy the old mill of Guilford in 2008. They've kept the millstones grinding ever since. Amy, this is absolutely beautiful, but I have to ask, what in the world possessed you to buy a grist mill? 
Well, I was a shopper here. I was a customer of the mill. I love the products. I love that they didn't add any additives to the product. They didn't alter their, their cornmeal, their flour. And I thought that was the way I wanted to cook. So I, when I heard the mill was for sale, I, my husband and I came and looked at the business and decided this would be a good fit for us. And do you have any background or your family have any background in milling? Absolutely not. No background. We had to learn as we went. And it's a, we learn something new every day. And we are very grateful for the people who have been here to help us with that process. And where do you find the products that you use to make your, your grains and you know where do you source the corn and the flour and the wheat, all that sort of stuff? We buy corn and soft wheat from local farmers. We buy um, honey and jam from local farmers and we sell crafts from people around the area who sell them to us and then we sell them for them. We have a blacksmith um, who does some iron work for us and we have um, just other sorts of crafts, paintings, pictures, things like that. So this is a beautiful destination as far as a one stop. You can get a little bit of everything that's North Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we like about it. And it's a very comfortable feel. The food's great quality, easy to make. And uh, that's what we like about it. It's beautiful. It I can't wait to see more. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things that's so amazing about the old mill of Guilford is that it pretty much operates the same way today as it did 200 years ago. It's just that now they're not totally dependent on the water wheel to power the mill. Annie Laura Perdue is the miller. Annie Laura, explain to me how this giant water wheel makes the grist mill run and work. Normally it would be uh, turning the gears inside the gears inside would be attached to the generator. Okay. And the generator would power the equipment in the mill and turn the mill stones. Okay. Uh, in the past, it could be run off belts. It could also be run off electric motors that are connected to Duke Power. That is how we're using the mill at this time because we have to repair the big pipe that carried the water from the mill pond. Okay, so you have three different ways that three, this mill can be Three sources powered. of power. We've had to have it that way for many years because we've had droughts. Right. And the creek would practically disappear. Right, and you need and options to make those. And we've got to have options because this is a business. Right, okay. Uh, now, because it is stone ground, does that do anything different as far as texture or flavor to your products? The flavor is always good if your corn is good. And uh, folks just like to have the stone ground product because it's more natural. It's how it was done for hundreds of years, has been done really for thousands of years. And it's less processed than something that would be ground in a roller mill, uh, a big, processing plant. Right. Uh, a lot of the bigger plants are going to stones also. They use... They They're use going back a, to the traditional they way. They use the stones, yes. Okay. And uh, it's, it's just less processed. Well, I'd love to learn about the process. Can you take me inside and walk me through it? Absolutely. Annie Laura didn't just show me the meal. She put me straight to work. Step one, Pour 100 pound bags of North Carolina grown corn down the chute and into the bin. You see, when the bags of corn, wheat, barley, or other whole grain arrives at the mill, it first has to be cleaned. It's poured into bins in the basement, and from there it goes through a Rube Goldberg type arrangement of chutes, belts, buckets, blowers, and whirling gears. It's a little complicated to explain, but just trust me, somehow it all works. Annie Laura, we dumped those big old bags of corn down in the floor. They went upstairs, did their magical thing. What's next? All right, after the corn is cleaned, we're going to open this chute. Uh huh. And we're going to let the corn out. come out. And once this bin is filled, I will turn on the millstones and the sifter, and we will make cornmeal. Oh, now what's special about your cornmeal? All of the all of the product is still there except for a tiny bit of bran and it makes a beautiful crust. 
uh -huh. on the cornbread and it has a wonderful flavor. I love a little crust on my cornbread. All right, once this gets full, show me what's next. I'm ready to turn on the millstones and the sifter. The machinery shakes and rattles the corn into the millstones where it's ground. Then the sifter jiggles and wiggles the mill through a mesh and into big barrels ready to be bagged up. Lisa, this is our finished cornmeal. It's a beautiful color. It's, this is our yellow cornmeal. It's ready to be made into mixes or placed into bags. And how do you know when the cornmeal is the right texture? You know by the way it feels. You learn to gauge the fineness or the coarseness by feel. And if it's not right, what do you have to do? You tighten the stones to make it finer. You widen them apart to make it coarser. Okay. Well, I would love to see the next step in the process of the cornmeal. What do you do next? The next thing we do is either make it into mixes or put it in a bag as plain cornmeal. Oh, can you show me? I will. <laughs> Once ground, the grain is then ready to blend into the scrumptious mixes for cookies, pancakes, biscuits, and muffins that Annie creates, or to simply bag in their purest, simplest form. Even in this last step, things are still done the old-fashioned way, by hand. Lisa, you've almost finished your first day as a Dusty, a miller's helper. We're going to put the cornmeal in the bag. Okay. So you've got to get this to a certain weight, and then we're going right. to bag it up. Put in right. your recipe. Okay. Now, what else do you bag up? We make sweet potato muffin mix. Hush puppy mix, cookie mixes, scone mixes. Uh, What's your best seller? Pancakes. This best seller is sweet potato muffin mix. And furthest place you've shipped? Your An island in the South Pacific. We have an order for a load of grits to go to England to a gentleman this coming week. Now, is he really from England or is he a southerner I, who's moved over? I England? think he's a southerner that moved over England. there. And you gotta yes. have your grits. Absolutely. Well, got to have them. There, there you is go. your first bag of cornmeal. You did a great job. Well, I've had a great time. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming. I enjoyed being a dusty. Thank with you. you. <laughs> <laughs> the finished products are sold to restaurants and shops all over the state, online, and at the mill store. Beyond the stone ground products created here, the mill itself is a big draw. After all, it's not every day you can stop by a place that was turning out great stone ground products when George Washington was around and then take some home for yourself. There's nothing I love more than finding new ways to use familiar ingredients. So you know I'm gonna find someone to show me some new tricks with the products I picked up from the old mill of Guilford. Who better than Chef John Jones of J. Pepper's Southern Grill here in Kernersville? John, I must confess, I peeked at your menu before coming, which looks fabulous, so I'm so excited to learn how you cook. Well, great. What are we cooking? Well, today we're going to start with the old mill grits, and what we're going to do with them is we're going to make grit cakes out of them which is kind of a little bit different twist, and we use them here at the restaurant at J. Peppers to do our shrimp and grits, but we're gonna show you some different applications. So we're gonna start with the grits. We're okay. gonna start with our pan and get it hot. We're gonna add two cups of chicken stock, fresh chicken stock. If you don't have that available, canned is fine. It's okay. A cup and a half of heavy whipping cream. Okay. We've got two teaspoons of salt, one teaspoon of onion powder, and one teaspoon of garlic powder. We're going to blend that all in. Now, do you need to bring that to a boil? Yes, no, we're going to let this come to a boil and then we'll slowly add our grits. Okay, if you didn't want to use chicken stock, can you use vegetable stock? Vegetable broth would be just, just fine. Good. If you were vegetarian right. or vegan and had that concern, absolutely. You could put that in there. You might want to add a little more salt. Okay, all right, so that comes to a boil and then we'll add our grits. Okay. Okay, well after a couple minutes now, our, our liquid has come to a nice roaring bowl. And what we're going to do is we're going to slowly add the grits. When doing the old mill grits, you really want to be careful not to add too much at a time. They'll clump up on you pretty badly. And I'm noticing two different colors, so you're using their yellow and white grits. I, I mix their yellow and white grits. I think it gives a nice uh, color blend when the grits are done. And there's really not a whole lot of flavor difference in the two but I just think it has a great look to it. And you can see this is getting thick already. We're gonna reduce our heat down to a low simmer. Okay. 
Okay, it's getting nice and thick now. You can see that. And uh, how long are you gonna cook this? We're gonna cook this for about 10, 10 to twelve minutes. Do you and need to stir it the whole time? We'll, we'll stir it occasionally, and you'll see if it gets a little too thick. We'll just add just a touch more cream, just to thin it out, just to keep it from scorching. All right, John, that looks done. What's our next step? And it is done. There, you can see they're nice and thick and they're tighter than their normal grit that you would serve at, at breakfast. So we're going to take these grits and we're going to take them into this pan. Okay, so you're just packing them into a loaf pan. Put them in a loaf pan that you can see I've lined with some cling wrap. And what that'll do, it'll allow it to uh, come out nice and easy when we're wanting to remove it. I just take it and smooth it over. Okay, kind of pack it down a little pack bit. Pack it down. You want it, it's important to pack it down a little bit because you want the grits all to be one one solid cake. And a lot of times I'll give it a little. Okay. And then it's ready to go. Now I'll place this in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. uncovered for the first couple hours. Okay. So that all the heat can escape from it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll wrap it up tightly and we'll leave it in there a minimum of 12 hours to let the cake set up really nicely okay. so it'll fry well. well. Let's pop it in the refrigerator overnight. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, Lisa, this is one we did yesterday so we'd have it ready. Why don't you flip it over on the cutting board? See how easy oh, that comes, comes off? comes right out. And the clean wrap really helps. And you, you can feel how firm that is. Mm -hmm. Nice and firm. It is. You know, it's solid. Just, it is. It has to be solid. So why don't you go ahead and cut a couple slices for us. About that That looks thick. great. And you can feel it's got a little resistance to it. Mm -hmm, it does. You can cut me four of them. Four of them? There you go. Four, and we're going to drop them down in the fryer. Now, if you were at home, you could do this in a fry daddy. Okay. Or you could do it in a skillet with a little bit of oil in it. And if you did it in a skillet with a little bit of oil in it, you would want to coat it with a little bit of flour just to keep it from breaking up. Okay, okay. Because the oil is not surrounding it like it is in How fry. long are you going to fry that? We're going to fry these about two minutes till they're golden brown and crispy. All right, great. Okay, Lisa, it's been about three and a half minutes and the grit cakes are done. Oh, look at them. They're look at them. They're, no, they're nice golden brown. We're going to take them and just put them on a drip towel real quick, just for a second, to get that excess grease off. And we're going to lay them on the plate here. And they're wonderful. You see, they got a nice they're little nice crunch. Firm. Yeah, you yeah, can feel it. Yeah, crunchy on the outside. Now, how would you variation. serve these? Normally we do these with shrimp and grits here at J Peppers. Okay. But I wanted to give you a different, couple different variations. Here's a couple over easy eggs with some bacon. Great for breakfast. Which makes breakfast a for breakfast. Dinner. And then here's a little tasso ham cream sauce, which makes for a wonderful side oh, dish. Kind of like a little gravy. A little gravy right there. And you, you could do your shrimp and grits. You could you could be creative. You know, you can just do these as a side dish right. all by themselves. Just fried grit cakes served with a little bit of salt and pepper and some butter. They make a wonderful side, side dish. dish. We sell a lot of these as a side dish here. They're beautiful. I love them. They're good. <laughs> All right, John, I'm seeing some oysters and I love oysters. Oh, what are we yeah. doing? We're gonna take these oysters and we're gonna dip them in the old mill seafood batter mix, mm -hmm. which is made with uh, dill and lemon zest and fresh cornmeal and herbs and spices. So all that's already in there. It's already in there, ready to go. You just gotta pick it up in there, drop it in there. You could do shrimp, you could do fish Why, in anything. there, anything. The oysters, we don't need to dredge in anything because they're so liquidy. Okay. But if you did shrimp or fish, you would might wanna dip them in a little egg batter. Okay, buttermilk. Oh, butter milk batter. So we're just tossing the coat gently. Okay. Good and coated. We're going to take them and we're going to drop them in the fryer. Now, if you don't have a big old fryer like you, how do I do it at home? Well, if you don't have a fry daddy, then I would take a pan with about a half an inch of oil in it, heat it up to about 350 degrees, okay. and then when they seem to be brown and nice on the edge, flip it over with a pair of tongs. Oh, okay. Until they're just cooked. get them on both sides. You just want them to be nicely brown. You know, the oyster doesn't have to be cooked all the way. Right. How long are you going to fry those? About two minutes. About two minutes. Okay. Can't wait to see them. All right. The oysters are done. You can see they're a nice golden brown. Yeah, pretty color. They yeah. look crisp. They are crisp. That's the great thing about this breader is it crisps up really nice. We're just going to take them and arrange them on this uh, 
Feta Play, greens. Feta greens. We've got a little rumelade sauce in there. You can use cocktail sauce, tartar sauce, a balsamic dipping sauce if you'd like. And there you have it, a quick, simple, easy appetizer. You can do them in batches if you're entertaining and it's just really a neat and uh, fun dish. It, it doesn't get any easier than that. I think I could do it. No, I know you could. <laughs> I love dessert. But this what is are a good we, one. I know I was gonna say, so what are we making? We're gonna make the old mill gingerbread, uh, which is a simple recipe. The recipe comes in the bag, as do all their bags. Everyone's included with the recipe inside of it. Oh, I see, I love that. Yeah, that yeah. way you know what to do with the product. It's very simple. So what we've got is two and a half cups of the mix. Uh -huh. We're adding a half a cup of oil. You can use butter or margarine melted also. And a cup and a half of boiling water. And that is it. And you just mix that together. You that, don't need a blender or anything. Nothing. Mix it by just hand. hand mix. You don't want to over mix it. It's just as simple as it can be. You could add raisins or some nuts to this if you'd like. Okay. Um, and are we making a cake or? We're going to make it into a loaf a pan. A loaf pan. Yes. Okay. And then we just take that and then we Is this it, a grease drink? It, it is grease. Uh, and we just pour it right in there. You can see because of the water that was hot how easy the batter pours in there. And that's just exactly enough for one loaf pan. And how long are we going to cook this? We're going to bake this for about 20 to 25 minutes in a 350 degree oven or until a pit comes out clean. Clean. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Lisa, we're ready to go. Oh. We've got the bread just came out of the oven. They Looks look wonderful, so good. doesn't it? That's beautiful. Yeah. How are you going to fix them up? What we're going to do is take an old mill recipe. This is one of the things they recommend. We took fresh peaches from the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. We tossed it with a little bit of sugar and some grand marnier. And basically, I'm just going to pour it all over it. And you can see that oh. juice that macerated oh. juice coming out of there. Then we're gonna take some fresh whipped cream. You can see I didn't whip it all the way. It's still got a little bit of uh, runniness to it. You know, you have taken a traditional gingerbread, which I think of the holidays, for gingerbread, and made it a fabulous summer dessert. It is, it's wonderful, it's light, it's refreshing with the peaches and the mint and the cream and the Grand Marnier. Have a bite. I, I'm gonna taste it, I'm excited. Get a little everything. That gingerbread is wonderful. It's very moist. Just isn't enough it? flavor and it's not overpowering. Okay, good. Delicious. Well, good. Okay, I'm seeing we have the Old Mills Whole Wheat Pancake Mix. Whole Wheat Pancake Mix, which we're going to make a waffle mix out of Lisa. So in here we've got some milk, some egg, oil, and sugar, or you could add honey. Mm -hmm. And I've adopted this recipe, added just half a cup of extra of the mix so it'll blend well. So it's thicker for waffles. Absolutely. It's a little thin if you do it for waffles. And then I'm gonna mix some fresh blueberries in there. Uh, could you, what else could you mix in? You could do raisins, craisins, chocolate chips, anything that you would like. Okay, Lisa, we're gonna add our waffle mix to it. We're about how much? Spread it out by the cup. Okay. We're spread it out, we're gonna put it in there. We're gonna invert this one. We're gonna wait about two minutes until the buzzer goes off and it'll be ready. Let's wait. Okay, is my waffle ready? Your waffle's ready. Let's open it up. Oh, look at that. Look at that beautiful color from those blueberries. Oh, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Lift it out. We'll place it on the plate. We'll add a little oh, whipped cream. Oh, whipped cream. Some fresh blueberries. And there you go. You are ready to go. All right, I'm going to give it a little taste. I love the fact that it's a whole wheat waffle. It, it is, and it's just... And very it's all moist, natural products. All natural, very easy to use, very simple recipes to follow. That is light and fluffy. It really is nice waffle. It is delicious. Thank you so much. My I've enjoyed pleasure. this. I have too. Thank you. Great Southern food deserves great Southern ingredients. There's a reason why some things become tradition. Why tried and true methods like stone grinding whole grains, well, become tried and true. 
I just love learning about the work and skill that goes into making top-notch ingredients like the stone ground whole grains from the old mill of Guilford. Let's face it, sometimes the old ways really are the best ways. I'm Lisa Prince and I'll see you next time right here in Flavor NC. see today's recipes or for more information on local food and farmers markets in your area, visit FlavorNC.com. Flavor NC was made possible by Got to Be NC Agriculture, the official state identity program for products grown and processed by farmers and value-added food companies in North Carolina. When you want the best, it's got to be NC the Currituck County Department of Travel and Tourism, the Currituck County Outer Banks. More value, more excitement, more than you imagined. Additional support was provided by the following. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV.